truck was a different organization in product than cars was. So there was a director of, I was director of car product planning. There was a director of uh, truck product planning. And the interesting, th this kind of illustrates the Chrysler strategy. The guys at the truck came up with uh, an idea called the club cab, which they subsequently called the club cab, which is to extend the cab enough to be able to put a kitty seat in the back and storage area for golf clubs, etc. They couldn't sell that to management because management, Ford and GM did not have a comparable model. So consequently, in the, the idea of, of Townsend and Ricardo, if Ford and GM didn't have it, there must not be a market, so therefore we wouldn't have one. It was really well, George Butts, who was the director of truck product planning, who subsequently became my boss, was a good friend. George sold the management on tooling the club cab with what's called Kirksite tooling, which is uh, prototype tooling. You can't make a can't make a lot of parts out of it, but you but you actually draw metal, and it's representative metal for making a prototype car. Well, I don't know how many thousand you can make out of Kirksite, but it's in the few thousand, and that's all. So they went into production with Kirksite tooling for the club cab, and the market took care of that because once they saw the vehicle, they went wild for it, and then the management could see that they could get the, their money back, and they authorized the hard tools for it. So George got around the problem, the roadblock management went in front of him by making it a partial uh, or a prototype type vehicle, and let the market, with their demand and with the orders, say, that's what I want. You know, in my opinion, when they did that, trucks stopped being trucks. Huh? When they added that club cab, trucks stopped being real trucks. <laughs> that's that's why right. they say there are no two-door trucks available, because they're cars. You're absolutely right. And I, I have a business. We use two-door, eight-foot box pickups for deliveries. So what we're we supposed to do now? Send one guy out with an empty back seat and a six foot box? Right. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any sense. And no steps on body, really. The cowboy Cadillac, that's what I want. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we just have to keep running the trucks we have, I guess. So Bert, were you involved with the with the three hundred Hearst program then? Three hundred Hearst program? Nineteen seventy? Uh, uh, pretty much Hearst did it. Yes, we were. We all tried it, but they pretty much took over and did the whole thing. You know, they, that's an interesting to me because all the complaints that we had over gear shift mechanism, Hearst answered, which made it quite clear what we were doing. We were making it too flexible. You know, it didn't feel have that solid feel like you're really moving a gear. And, um, they did, they did the work and they did well. All we did was apply it within our production. But there was no hearse shifter in the hearse. Huh? There was no hearse shifter in a hearse. In the 300 hearse. Oh, I don't know. I, I was thinking of B bodies. The fiberglass head. Yeah. Well, see, I used to own the prototype and it actually had yeah, a I hearse don't, shifter. I don't remember. I don't remember that we did a B by a Hearst ship. Did we do a Hearst 300? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. one year. Did we? 1975. But when I bought that prototype, I got all the paperwork because the prototype was a Hearst uh, factory executive car for three or four years. And with the car, it became all this paperwork detailing exactly what Chrysler charged and what parts they shipped to Chrysler. Yeah. to build those cars. Unfortunately, uh, that's all lost somewhere. I've been looking for it for 30 years. <laughs> and last Saturday at the Gilmore Museum where they had Mopars at the Red Barns, they had the only 
300 Hearst convertible, the 70 convertible there that came in from Washington State, and that car has the Hearst shifter on it also, yeah. floor shifter. That's the Linda Bond car. Yeah, Linda enjoyed that car. I ended up riding uh, with her when I'd gone a couple times out to the auctions in Arizona in January, and coincidentally, two years in a row, on the shuttle bus from the rental car place back to the airport, sat next to her, and one year I asked her about the, the Hearst convertible. She said, oh yeah, that was a big old car. That car just ran and ran. We were down in Florida one time and driving with the girls, and we didn't think about looking at the gas gauge, so we ran out of gas. And she said, I just put two of our girls on the hood of the car, and the truck stopped right away, and uh, no problem. It's supposed to be about 500 coupes in the one convertible, is what I had heard. Bert and I had a discussion outside just briefly with the rim tubes and that hot rod. That Billy, Billy, the, the, uh, your Hemi 270 that uh, they won, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but C altered, the old C altered class with the drags, is weight to cubic inches, that's it, okay? And so this car won, this is when I first got involved with some of this stuff. It won the, the Nationals five years in a row, 57 to 61, every year. Wow. 270 cubic inches, right? Mm. Right in the middle of 283, 265 Chevys, mm. running also weight to cubic inches. So when I saw this guy, he was a preacher, a minister from Texas, right? He built this whole thing himself using the Dodge motor. And what used to happen, the Chevy would beat them by a length off the line, and about 80, you'd hear the heavy sound right in the ramp. Oh, God, right at that. <laughs> and the Chevy guys would go crazy, right? Yeah. So I asked him, I said, do you think there was inspiration to Chrysler engineers from seeing that in 57? Because it sure inspired me. <laughs> that uh, ram manifold, where it came from, with those high and mighty guys and all that stuff. Well, I'm sure glad that the engineering, in 57 anyway, was an awful lot better than the construction. 57 was... That, that the engineering was so superior to the construction of the cars. Oh, well... <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a painful subject, 57. I don't know. You know, we used to say you never stop production. That was the problem. We never stop production. In 57, there were people with tears in their eyes begging the management to stop production. And they did stop production for about 30 days while they tuned things up, you know, that didn't fit, and then started it again. And uh, uh, those were painful times because then we had to go out and resell the product to the dealers. We had to say to the dealers, look, we know we got off to a bad start. We shut everything down for 30 days, so we fix everything, so here we are. And we were in Lubbock, Texas, and Bill Braden, the general sales manager, went, he's the presenter, I was just there, in case there was a question. He was the presenter, and he presented the whole thing, and he said, look, guys, we are so serious about this thing, we put a man in the trunk of every car when it goes through water tests and to seal it in case it leaks. And a Texan dealer yelled up from the back of the room, let the son of a bitch out, he'll drown. Pardon <laughs> 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 me, language, but that's what he said. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was tough. And, and my favorite letter, we used to get a lot of letters that some got referred to product planning for engineering for answering and some of them were just handled by service. But my favorite one that ended up on my desk was a guy wrote in and said, I just got my 57 New Yorker hard job. Thank you very much because I slammed the door on my fingers and never heard a bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a good one. That's fair.
<laughs> yeah, we, we, we weren't ready in 57. Yeah. Because the 55, 56, I think we call that the forward look, yes. didn't produce what we expected. They decided they couldn't run the 55, 56, another year 57, and they pulled the 58 ahead a year. And we really weren't ready. When did they, do you, do you have any idea what month of the year, I mean, how, how far ahead of the actual introduction of 57s did they choose to, to bring the 58s into the 57 year? Probably a year, they probably, uh, they had to have at least a year. Uh -huh. what, the, what you, things you can give up, we had a prototype Clairpoint assembly plant where we built prototype cars on production tooling, but we're proving out the tools as well as the sheet metal. And we built those cars, pre-production cars, they called them, as opposed to prototypes are built one-off. Pre-production cars are built with production type tooling, but in this Clearpoint facility. You eliminate that and you do the pre-production, you don't do pre-production, what you do is you do it on the final line. So you take that whole, that probably took six months out right there. And then uh, you cheat a little here, a little there, and so on, get the other six months. I think it would be interesting to see what the 57s were going to be before they I was just thinking that. <laughs> Before they took that next year, the 58s, and moved it forward, uh, you you may have some recollection of what the 57s were going to look like if they were a, a, a modification of the 56s. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I do know that we, pulling the 57 ahead a year, it had the torsion bar front suspension, did not get the um, durability testing it normally gets because the time wasn't there and uh, uh, subsequently uh, the customer ended up testing the suspension system which was okay except that we hadn't sealed the torsion bars adequately where they were anchored into the control arm and what happened is that filled up with in the rust belt area, we call it, it filled up with the mud and salt, and it etched the exterior of the bar. And the exterior of the bar is the most heavily stressed part of the bar, and so that was uh, affected by the corrosion, caused what we call stress risers, and the torsion bars broke, broke. Maybe you remember some yeah, experience absolutely. with oh, people yeah. with broken torsion bars. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, that was that was one of the penalties that we had for uh, taking the year out because that cost us the loss of durability testing. Mm -hmm. So you probably know how we fixed that. You, we put a filled it with grease and put a grease seal on it. Yeah. So. It, it would uh, would keep the mud and the salt out of it. Sure. Kind of related to that, why were there so many ball joints in that period and different sizes on the control arm bushings and that? What was so it? many what? Uh, ball joints? Sizes of ball the joints. Sizes, all the different sizes. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm sure that that's all trying to make the car no heavier. That is necessary to do the job. We never, we never put a price tag on that, but I had my own rule of thumb that I told my guys: if it costs a dollar and you can save a pound, do it. If it's going to, going to cost more than that, let's talk about it. But if you can figure out how to make the door hinge a dollar more and a pound less by changing the material, let's do it. Probably some smart money guy could figure out what the right number is, but we just used it in dollar because it's 
came up here. <laughs> and when the boss, when the boss uh, get tell you something, it goes through the whole department. You know, that becomes the rule. Bert, when they were designing the 57s especially, how close were you in engineering working with Virgil Exner and the, his design guys? You know, that whole thing coming together. How much did engineering work in it? How closely did you work with the design people, with Virgil Exner and his troops? We did, the answer is not as close as we should have been. But we did the answer with them. But in general, the stylists and the product planners thought, well, the engineers want a bigger wheel lip because they want chain clearance. They want the biggest tire and chain clearance on top of it. And we don't want the wheel lips to be any bigger than they are. So uh, there's always uh, some conflict between them. And probably that interfered with the openness that I think would be desirable. And then, uh, this, is a, this is really a mistake in, that we did, and I suspect GM and Ford did it too. We did cars without involving manufacturing. That was wrong. We sh they should have been part of the design, rather than us to design the car, give it to manufacturing, and have them struggle with it, or change it, or do something. We should have had them right in there. And that same thing happened in the purchasing area. We never trusted the suppliers so we designed a part, and the purchasing people sent it out to four different people to quote on it. When I went to work for Prince Corporation, and when I saw it in Mitsubishi too, when I worked in Tokyo for four years, they had the wiper people come in and sit down in the advanced engineering department and design the whole wiper system for a Mitsubishi car. Design where the motor was mounted, where the arms that have to go around swing, and the, the links and the blades and everything, the pivots, the blades, the whole thing. And they did that on the car. Now, take it to, to Chrysler, and then that's the way it was built. Take it to Chrysler. We designed the whole windshield wiper system. It went out to Anderson and Trico and other suppliers and they bid on it. But mostly what they said is if you would change this, or change that, or change this, we could build it better, or build it cheaper, or something like that. We would say, we don't have time for that. You know, do it next year, the following year, do it as a running change. And actually we didn't involve manufacturing, and I hope today, and I, I get some input, but I'm too far from it to really know. John might know better than that. To the extent that we bring manufacturing and suppliers and engineering in on designing a new product. Are they in? Are they in? They're in there early. Good. So, they're, they're part, of the, part of the plan from the beginning. I Purchasing wouldn't buy it because, at Chrysler, because, and presumably Ford GM, because they didn't trust the suppliers. So they didn't want to pre-source anything until it all been checked. Is that because they thought they were dishonest or just not as smart? Why, why did they not trust their suppliers? You know, I don't know that. I'd have to be in purchasing to answer that. I, I don't know that. I have to tell you an interesting thing.